My name is Dan Jelton. I'm the director of the library. Um, and always happy to uh, introduce this, this day, um, which we uh, position in uh, National Poetry Month, but at the very, very end of the month, because we like it to be outside. It's called Poetry on the Patio. And I think for the two, this is our 13th, um, probably at least 10 have been outside. I think this may be the third that's been inside, but it's the second in a row, so I'm, I'm sorry. At least it wasn't, it, it was a no-brainer today. At least we didn't have to, you know, think about whether we could go out or not. Um, that made it easy. So for 13 years, uh, Julie Kimlinger uh, has been recruiting people from all walks of life at the University of St. Thomas to come and stand up and read a poem that's important to them. Not their own writing, but something that they, that they know and love. And um, hundreds and hundreds of people, not probably hundreds and hundreds, hundreds, some, something over 100, between 100 and 200 maybe, um, have done this. So it's like 10 every year, so maybe 130, 140, something like that. Yeah. Um, have done this and it's been really just so great. And it's a, as I often say, it's kind of like a, um, is it a, not a smorgasbord, but a potluck, you know. So everybody just, we don't tell people what to bring or what to read. They just bring what they love. And sometimes there's, as at any potluck, there's, uh, you know, too many salads. And sometimes there's too, too much to dessert or whatever. But uh, I always feel like this works out, just, it just works out for some reason. So um, the, 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 um, Favorite poem project was started by the then poet laureate Robert Pinsky, I guess about 13 years ago. Um, he was the poet laureate of the United States. And he started it because he felt really strongly that poetry is written to be read. It's not written to be read silently. It's written to be read out loud, that it's a kind of song, and that, that a poem doesn't really um, isn't really sort of fully realized until it's said out loud. And I, I agree with him after listening to people read poems for 13 years. Um, I agree with him on that. I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to see what he was up to this year. So I, I did a search and found um, that he was actually pretty busy during National Poetry Month, um, uh, including uh, doing an interview for uh, a blog published by uh, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and I wanted to read what he said uh, about the month. The question, the question was, instituting a National Poetry Month is a controversial topic for many poets. What are your thoughts? The, the interviewer asked, and he said, it's harmless and it may do some good. If it sends a few more people to poems, then fine. I confess that personally I feel maybe it has, as the expression used to go, gotten old. Somebody told me that it is also National Cheese Month and National Tire Month. <laughs> we need to remember that the art is large and fundamental, not a mere product. As long as that's the main idea, there's no harm in join che joining cheese and tires. Uh, but then uh, later, uh, the interviewer says, in your opinion, what makes a great poetry reading? And Pinsky said, when I'm in the audience, the best feeling for me is when my desire for poetry itself is kindled. In other words, not just a good show or an appealing personality or absorbing monologue, but a feeling of love for or awe of or desire for poetry. I feel reminded why poetry exists. And in fact, that's what has happened uh, for me uh, low these many years. Um, this is the way this works. Everybody has a program. Um, most of you in the audience are actually going to be reading, um, but we have some people who are here just to listen to poetry, too. That always happens and it warms my heart. Um, uh, so in the order that your name appears on here, come on up, tell us who you are, uh, what you do at St. Thomas, and uh, why the poem that you're going to read is, is important to you. Sometimes people applaud between poems and sometimes they don't. I don't know if there's a convention on that. I sort of prefer not to have the applause, but whatever. If it strikes you, I'll do it, I guess. I'm going to read something uh, by Raymond Carver, who I know probably, I knew first as a, 
a fiction writer. He was um, uh, a practitioner of this minimalist style in the 80s that was copied by, I think, as many writers at that time as were copying Ernest Hemingway, a very spare style of storytelling, um, very, very influential. Uh, but he turns, uh, it turns out he's a really great poet as well. He died in um, uh, 1988 prematurely uh, from, from cancer. And I like this, uh, I, li I really like this poem. Uh, it, it, as I was going through his um, collected poems, I found lots of them that sort of related to um, appreciating the moment that you're in, as, as this one does. It's called, it's called This Morning. This morning was something. A little snow lay on the ground. The sun floated in a clear blue sky. The sea was blue and blue-green as far as the eye could see, scarcely a ripple, calm. I dressed and went for a walk, determined not to return until I took in what nature had to offer. I passed close to some old bent-over trees, crossed a field strewn with rocks where snow had drifted, kept going until I reached the bluff, where I gazed at the sea and the sky and the gulls wheeling over the white beach far below, all lovely all bathed in a pure cold light. But as usual, my thoughts began to wander. I had to will myself to see what I was seeing and nothing else. I had to tell myself this is what mattered, not the other. And I did see it for a minute or two. For a minute or two it crowded out the usual musings on what was right and what was wrong. Duty, tender memories, thoughts of death, how I should treat with my former wife all the things I hoped would go away this morning, the stuff I live with every day, what I've trampled on in order to stay alive. But for a minute or two, I did forget myself and everything else. I know I did. For when I turned back, I didn't know where I was until some birds rose up from the gnarled trees and flew in the direction I needed to be going. Daniel. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Daniel Carr and I'm a senior here at St. Thomas. Um, today I'm going to be reading uh, the poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley, which you know, as of late has become sort of cliche in our, especially in America due to the, the rugby movie that came out, but nevertheless uh, it's a, an incredible poem. Um, and after that I'll be reading Anything Can Be, which is a, it's a short little Shel Silverstein poem that, that really motivated me through my athletic days. So. Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, black is the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how strong the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And anything can be. Shel Silverstein. Listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to, listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never haves, then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. Hi, my name is uh, Corey Funk. I'm the administrative assistant for academic counseling. Um, I'd like to thank Dan for uh, Daniel for reading uh, Shel Silverson, by the way, who I don't think gets enough credit for inspiring people with poetry for their entire lives. It starts early and keeps going. Um, I picked two poems. Uh, the Bottle is Drunk Out by One by Philip Larkin and uh, Acquainted with the Night by Robert Frost uh, because I don't sleep. Um, it has been pointed out to me throughout the years that normal people sleep hours at a time uninterrupted. They don't get up and wander the house three or four times a night just for fun. 
I do. Uh, and apparently most people sleep more than five to six hours a night. And that's normal? Okay. If that works for you, that's great. Um, it works for me. Uh, my wife has gotten over it. All my roommates have gotten over it. I just get up and wander the night. It's what I do. And then I go back to sleep. Um, and both of these poems are about the two things you do when you're up in the middle of the night. You either wander or you sit there and think. And that's kind of it. Everything else I think is a felony, basically. But um, <laughs> here you go. Uh, the Bottle is Drunk Out by One by Philip Larkin. The bottle is drunk out by one. At two, the book is shut. At three, lovers lie apart, love and its commerce done. And now the luminous watch hands show after four o'clock, time of the night when straying winds trouble the dark. And I am sick for want of sleep, so sick that I can half believe the soundless river pouring from the cave is neither strong nor deep, only an image fancied in conceit. I lie and I wait for morning and the birds, the first steps going down the unswept street, voices of girls with scarves around their heads. And acquainted with the night, uh, I love Robert Frost, by the way, uh, just as a personal note. Um, man, I just keep coming back to his stuff. Uh, and this one, I just, the first time I read it, I went, hey, I've done that. Uh, and it seems particularly apropos for the second line today. Um, acquainted with the night by Robert Frost. Uh, I have been one acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. Uh, I've outwalked the furthest city light. I've looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. I've stood still and stopped the sound of feet on far away an interrupted cry, came over houses from another street, but not to call me back or say goodbye. And further still, an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one, acquainted with the night. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Sachs. I work in the dean's office. I'm I'm the discipline dean, and uh, poetry is not necessarily my idiom. But when Julie asked me to do this, I said, "Yeah, I actually do have a poem, and it does have some meaning for me." Uh, my poem is "Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night" by Dylan Thomas, and I've always liked this poem. But it has special meaning for me. My father passed away about 15 months ago. And when he was diagnosed and the cancer got worse, he always had a good sense of humor. He says, if it's terminal, I can live with that. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm glad you got a sense of humor, Dad. <laughs> but it started to go south, and he had already started to hoard pills. And he was still willing to fight. He didn't want to give up yet. And <sighs> you run out of things to say, things to do. So this was the last thing I reached for when I was trying to convince him to keep going. If he wanted to stop, that would have been fine with me, but I reach for this. So do not go gentle into that good night. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end know dark is right. Because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright. Their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight. Blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So I'm Deborah Savage. I teach at the seminary. I'm on the faculty there and I teach mostly philosophy and some theology courses. And I'm a Wojtyla scholar. So I selected for a few reasons two poems from Carol Wojtyla, whom you probably know as John Paul II. Many people don't know that John Paul or Carol Wojtyla was a poet. And he also was a, an actor. He was in theater for many years, and he also uh, worked in a quarry. <laughs> 
So um, there's a lot that could be said about him, but of course this is not the time for that. Um, I wrote my dissertation in part on him and actually finished my chapter on him the day before he died in 2005 and have a special relationship with him and want to mention, must mention, that he's to be beatified on Sunday. So it seems fitting to read a couple from him. This is from his collected poems and uh, the first one I have is from uh, a section called Song of the Hidden God and I'll just read a selection from that. <clears throat> oh, to feel this moment of nothingness, the moment before creation, and never depart from it. We never depart from our shadow, and always go back to that time when I was nursed by your thought alone and was more innocent than a child, and deeper translucence was my own. Today, confused by existence, I keep forgetting my nothingness. I wander among the distant rays cut off from the rays that are simple. But one look into the depths revealing eternity, a stream passing by the door, and in one gaze so simple, I dwell in your thought once more. I am at one with myself in the brightness that hides. I become your thought and am fed by the love inside the white heat of bread. He often looks at me from out there, nailing my face with his gaze. Do you know, do you know, my brother, how he loves us, our Father? But the depth of his words no one knows, no one knows how far the farthest reason goes, how limitless his suffering was, solitude on the tree of the cross. No not the blood on the tree that blossomed as all labors blossom in the bread of tomorrow, only the Father's rejection, that sorrow of being rejected. For that cry, why hast thou forsaken me, Father, Father, and for the weeping of my mother, I have redeemed on your lips two simple words, our Father. This depth in me is so transparent, though my eyes are veiled by drifting mist. Do I deserve the current's depth as I rush on, a stream too swift? There my Lord comes each day and stays, a streak of blood dipped in the snow, and recognized, he recognizes. Breathing abundance, he repays. If only someone were to sweep the mist from the lucid depth, then it would show in what misery, then it would show in whom he hides. And everyone would see the light that floods the darkened depth. Yes, all would see it in man's heart, the simplest of the cosmic suns. The second one is uh, from a section in the book called The Quarry. And um, if I hadn't been reading this, I would have read Robert Penske's poem on work. He's fantastic on work. And my dissertation was on the subjective dimension of human work, which is something John Paul wrote about. And this one is named Material. Listen the even knocking of hammers so much their own. I project onto the people to test the strength of each blow. Listen now, electric current cuts through a river of rock and a thought grows in me day after day. The greatness of work is in man. Hard and cracked, his hand is differently charged by the hammer, and thought differently unravels in stone as human energy splits from the strength of the stone, cutting the bloodstream 
an artery in the right place. Look how love feeds on this well-grounded anger which flows into people's breath as a river bent by the wind and which is never spoken but just breaks high vocal cords. Passers-by scuttle off into doorways. Someone whispers, yet here is a great force. Fear not. Man's daily deeds have a wide span. A straight riverbed, riverbed can't imprison them long. Fear not. For centuries they all stand in him, and you look at him now through the even knocking of hammers. Bound are the blocks of stone, the low voltage wire cuts deep in their flesh, an invisible whip. Stones know this violence. When an elusive blast rips their ripe compactness and tears them from their eternal simplicity, the stones know this violence. Yet can the current unbind their full strength? It is he who carries that strength in his hands, the worker. Hands are the heart's landscape. They split sometimes like ravines into which an undefined force rolls. The very same hands which man only opens when his palms have had their fill of toil. Now he sees. Because of him alone, others can walk in peace. Hands are a landscape. When they split, the pain of their sores searches free as a stream. But no thought of pain, no grandeur in pain alone. For his own grandeur, he does not know how to name. No, not just hands drooping with the hammer's weight not the taut torso muscle shaping their own style, but thought informing his work, deep knotted in wrinkles on his brow, and over his head joined in a sharp arc, shoulders and veins vaulted. So for a moment he is a Gothic building cut by a vertical thought born in the eyes no, not a profile alone, not a mere figure between God and the stone, sentenced to grandeur and error. My name is Laurie Diamond, and I work in the theology department. And I have selected a couple of poems. The first of my poems is by Bill Holm, who is a Minnesota poet. And I love Bill Holm because he speaks of the simple things of life. And this poem in particular struck me last week when everybody was complaining about yet another snow. <laughs> because I woke up and thought it was really lovely knowing that it was 34 degrees out and that it was going to be gone soon. So I wanted to capture that moment of that wet, beautiful snow. And uh, I think he captured this moment too. Solstice poem for Christian Arneson. Three times in the night I threw off the quilt and rushed through the window to stare at the light on Mount Chinsensdall. At 12, it was pink, and the snow on the cliffs was a fire as if from within. At 4, it was gold and seemed almost to rise from the water. Every line on its face looked like print on a page or notes on a musical clef. And the birds that flew by were reading the message before diving to tremble the water. At 7, the mountain was once again brown with wisps of clouds overhead. Who can sleep on the solstice when out of the window this glory of light is erupting? No wonder the choirs or fishers and farmers all sing with such fire of feeling whenever the song of the mountain, whenever the song of the light on the mountain brings out 
for, from them over the water. Half a year onward, the light will be scarcer, the mountain shroud shrouded in snow, and the birds on the water will have gone away, leaving only the ghosts of their singing. But the songs of the choir, to the rhymes of the lovers, of the light over Tinsadal, are the storehouse of beauty, when humans most need it most, to remind them that everything lovely will come back again, and again, and again, if you keep it in language and music alive at the core of your soul. I'm an ordinary person, and lately I've just been reveling in that, and so I wanted to read this, <laughs> read this poem, and I want to dedicate it to Dan, who um, I've been married to for 36 years now. It is by Leah Furness, and it's called The Longlyweds Know. It's from a collection of poems um, by Garrison Keillor, Good Poems for Hard Times. The Longlyweds Know. That it isn't about the golden anniversary at all but about all the unremarkable years that Hallmark doesn't even make a card for. It's about the second anniversary when they were surprised to find they cared for each other more than last year. And the fourth, when both kids had chicken pox and she threw her shoe at him for no reason at all. And the sixth, when he accidentally got drunk on the way home from work because being a husband and a father was so damn hard. It's about the 11th and 12th and 13th years when they discovered they could survive crisis. And the 22nd anniversary when they looked at each other across the empty nest and found it was good. It's about the 37th year when she finally decided she could never change him. <laughs> and the 38th when he decided a little change wasn't that bad. It's about the 46th anniversary when they both bought cards and forgot to give them to each other. <laughs> but most of all, it's about the end of the 49th year when they discovered that you don't have to be old to have your 50th anniversary. I've only got 36 <laughs> so far, but we're working on 50. And I picked these two very short poems because um, I feel like you can capture beauty in just a few words. And these are by Brian Andreas, who, if you're not familiar with the story people, you see him a lot in prints and whatever. This particular one, called The Awakening, was written after 9-11. Uh, in those days, we finally chose to walk like giants and hold the world in arms grown strong with love. And there may be many things we forget in the days to come, but this will not be one of them. And for you, again, the ordinary things for, I have children, and uh, so I wanted this short one, called Calculated Risk. Are we your real children, they said. And, and I said, we had our pick of all the children in the world, so we took a few home to try out, and though we tried to return them later, it was more trouble than it was worth. And so we kept them, and loved them, and taught them all the stuff they'd need to know when it came time for them to choose, so they wouldn't make the same mistakes we did. And later I heard one of them say, they didn't know about being a parent if it was as risky as all that. My name is Joe Doctor, and I'm a sophomore. I actually work for Julie, um, and my intended major is entrepreneurship. I first became interested in poetry through folk music, as the lyrics are very similar to poems, and like poetry, they tell a very specific story. This led me to begin reading poetry and stumble across the works of Walt Whitman. 
For today, I chose this poem, Facing West from California's Shores, because I can relate to its theme. As you will see, the poem reflects on a man's search for his life purpose when he realizes he has traveled the world and lived a full life, but has not found what he was originally looking for. Right now, I'm in a position where I do not know what I'm looking for. I don't know what my calling is, or more practically, what type of career I might want in the near future. But, like the narrator of the poem, I plan on enjoying the experiences as I travel along my own journey. Facing west from California shores, inquiring, tireless, seeking what is yet unfound. I, a child, very old, over waves, towards the house of maternity. The land of migrations, look afar. Look off the shores of my western sea, the circle almost circled. For starting westward from Hindustan, from the veils of Kashmir, from Asia, from the north, from the god, the sage, and the hero, from the south, from the flowery peninsulas and the spice islands, long having wandered since, round the earth having wandered. Now I face home again, very pleased and joyous. But where is what I started for so long ago? And why is it yet unfound? Good afternoon, my name is Nat Nelson, relatively new here, just hired in the uh, School of Psychology on the Minneapolis campus in January. Pleasure to be here today on the St. Paul campus. I haven't spent much time here, in fact, I had to ask for directions on the way over, so <laughs> my plan is to make uh, a few more uh, trips over here in the near future. First poem that I've chosen here today is called Pied Beauty. Uh, first encountered, actually, if you've read M. Scott Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled, um, it's a very interesting excerpt uh, about a patient who um, had forgotten about his uh, spiritual journey earlier in his life and really it was only after encountering some crisis later in life that he remembered, oh yeah, uh, there are beautiful things in creation that remind us of all of the good that God has given us. And at the time I don't think I really appreciated um, the poem. I was only in my early 20s and was reminded of this poem recently. My wife and I are expecting in June and uh, to already see things moving and there's someone in there. I um, was really reminded of this poem. Sometimes we don't have to look too far to see those beautiful things. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim. Fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow. And all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle dim. He fathers forth, whose beauty is past change. Praise him. My friends and I, we go to happy hour on occasion, and we play silly games sometimes, and one recent game was all right, anyone in history, who are you going to have dinner with? Okay, one person. And recently sort of reviewed the Ken Burns Civil War uh, documentary and had recently finished Team of Rivals, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Just exceptional. And uh, with the Goodwin book, you, you know what happens in the end, just based on your elementary teachings. But it's so poignant at the end, the, the portrait that she paints of the loss of Abraham Lincoln. 
after he had just gotten through such tragedy, he finally had victory, and he's um, assassinated. And so searching around, well, uh, any contemporaries who wrote about Lincoln, and as I understand it, Walt Whitman was actually quite a fan and adored uh, Abraham Lincoln. So this is um, it's actually uh, lots we could say here from When Lilacs Last and the Dooryard Bloomed. Uh, just one tiny excerpt that I thought was especially meaningful. Sing on, sing on, you gray-brown bird. Sing from the swamps, the recesses, pour your chant from the bushes. Limitless out of the dusk, out of the cedars and pines. Sing on, dearest brother, warble your reedy song, loud human song with voice of uttermost woe. O liquid and free and tender, O wild and loose to my soul, O wondrous singer, you only I hear, yet the star holds me, but will soon depart. Yet the lilac with mastering odor holds me. So Abraham Lincoln, that's the one that I would choose. Who would you choose to have dinner with? So, hello. My name is Alexandre Ferreira, but I know it's hard for you, so I go by Alex. <laughs> it's much better. Um, so, I, I just want poem from Rumi. I don't know if he's, you know him. Uh, one of the reasons I choose one poem of him is uh, because this, because I know a lot of people don't know him and I guess you should know him. So there's a problem because you know it's translation and when you do translation you lose the music, you lose the rhythm of the original language. And he was, he wrote for, uh, in New Persian language. Uh, his name is not Rumi at all, but I cannot pronounce his name. But so, and he was Muslim, a Muslim poet, and also a philosopher of the Sufi mystic. And this was a kind of interesting for me because I received one book of Rumi from a friend, and I was hoping to find just theology matters, and it's not true. He talked about love, he talked about common life, some included some sensual love, some romantic love that I was not expecting to find in the theology guy. So I was really surprised, and I like his poems. So just a short one. If you want what visible reality can give, you are an employee. If you want the unseen words, you are not living your truth. Both wishes are foolish, but you will be forgiven for forgetting that what you really want is love's confusing joy. And the second one I chose was by Billy Collins, because I'm take one class, <coughs> sorry, one poetry class now, because my major is English. I forgot to talk about that. And uh, writing. And I mean, write a paper about Billy Collins. He's my mentor poet this semester. So I read a lot of books about, a lot of poems about him. And I chose him because he's tone in English, because looks like he's not writing a poem. It looks like he's just saying, he use, look like common words. Sure, when you start to read, you see he use iambic verses. He use always said about rhythm, but in the first sign you don't see this, look like someone just saying simple words and what he wants to say without looking for specific words to have to use dictionary to understand my case. So I'm sorry for my, if I kill the poem with my reading, but I'm try. <laughs> <laughs> so the name is Adesh. When it's late at night and the branches are bending against the windows, you might think that love is just a matter of leaping out of the frying pan of yourself into the fire of someone else. But it's a little more complicated than that. It's more like training the two birds who might be behind in that bush for the one you are not holding your hands. A wise man once said that love was like forcing a horse to drink, but then everyone stopped to think of him as wise. Let's be clear about something. Love is not as simple as get up of the wrong 
side of the bed wearing the emperor's clothes. No, it's more like the way the pen feels after it has defeated the sword. It's, like, it's little like the penny saved it or the nine dropped it stitches. You look at me through the halo of the last candle and tell me love is a ill, a Ill wind that has no turning, a road that blows no good. But I'm here to remind you, as our shadows tremble on the walls, that love is the early bird who is better late than never. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Covington, and I am a sophomore here. I am a I'm studying psychology here at St. Thomas. And I chose to read two poems by Emily Bronte, who is my favorite author. I think that um, a lot of people mistake her for just being really grotesque and kind of angry, but I feel like with the life that she led, she finds the beauty in darkness and a lot of things that other people can't see. So the first poem that I chose is called Stars. Ah, why? Because the dazzling sun restored our earth to joy. Have you departed every one and left a desert sky? Although the night, all through the night, your glorious eyes were gazing down in mine, and with a full heart's thankful sighs, I blessed with watch divine. I was at peace and drank your beams as they were life to me, and reveled in your changeful dreams like petrol on the sea. Thought followed thought, star followed star, through boundless regions on while one sweet influence, near and far, thrilled through and proved us one. Why did the morning dawn to break, so great, so pure, a spell, and scorch with fire the tranquil cheek, where your cool radiance fell? Blood red he rose, and arrow straight, his fierce beam struck my brow. The soul of nature sprang, elate, but mine sank sad and low. My lids closed down, yet through their veil I saw him blazing still, and steep in gold the misty dale, and flash upon the hill. I turned me to the pillow then, to call back night and see your worlds of solemn light again throb with my heart and me. It would not do, the pillow glowed, and glowed through both roof and floor. The birds sang loudly in the wood, and fresh winds shook the door. The curtains waved and wakened the flies were murmuring round my room, imprisoned there till I should rise and give them leave to roam. O oh, stars and dreams and gentle night, O oh, night and stars return and hide me from the hostile light that does not warm but burn, that drains the blood of suffering men, drinks tears instead of dew. Let me sleep through his blinding rain and only wake with you. The second poem I chose is called The Outcast Mother. I've seen this dell in July's shine, as lovely as an angel's dream. Above, heaven's depth of blue divine, around the evening's golden beam. I've seen the purple heather bell look out by many a storm-worn stone. Oh, and oh, I've known such music swell, such wild notes wake these passes alone. So soft yet so intensely felt, so low yet so distinctly heard, my breath would pause, my eyes would melt, and tears would do the green heath's ward. I'd linger here a summer's day, nor care how fast the hours flew by, nor mark the sun's departing ray, smile sadly from the darkening sky. Then, then, I might have laid me down, and dreamed my sleep would gentle be, I might have left thee, darling one, and thought thy guide was guarding thee. But now there is no wan wandering glow, no gleam to say that God is nigh, and coldly spreads the couch of snow, and harshly sounds thy lullaby. Forests of heather, dark and long, wave their brown branching arms above, and they must soothe thee with their song, and they must shield my child of love. Alas, the flakes are heavily falling. They cover fast each guardian crest, and chilly white their shroud is paling, thy frozen limbs and freezing breast. 
wake up the storm more madly wild, and mountain drifts are tossed on high. Farewell, unblessed, unfriended child. I cannot bear to watch thee die. So that applies us for everyone. I can everybody read beautifully, and once again, it was a beautiful uh, selection of poems. So uh, thank you, Julie, for putting the program together again. Thank you all for reading. We uh, we did record it. We always do, uh, and we the the video the videos are kind of just sitting up in the office, and uh, I don't know that anybody ever really looks at them, but they're there. <laughs> So I, I told Nat we're going to put together like a outtakes and bloopers thing, <laughs> put it on YouTube. So that'll be fun. Except there's never been any bloopers. But uh, thank you. We will see you again next year.